three. Well, hello, John. Uh, welcome to the New York Parrot interview series with the Literary Corner. I am Dustin Pickering, and we are going to have an excellent conversation. So first things first, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you come from, what your uh, you know current efforts are and literature. Um, well, where I come from, uh, my father was in the military, so I don't really come from anywhere. Uh, <laughs> same here. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I, I presently uh, live uh, just outside St. Louis. Um, mm -hmm. I lived for a long time in Toledo, Ohio. Um, I am the co-editor of two different, uh, for two different presses. Uh, one is uh, River Dog, which is based in Missouri. The other is the Gascony Review, which is based in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, and I've put out in the neighborhood of like 65 books. Um, I tend to do like anywhere from like six to 10 a year at this point. Um, I served as for three years as the city uh, appointed poet laureate for the town of Bell, Missouri, mm -hmm. and uh, presently a nominee for the poet laureate of the state. Oh, so, excellent. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. So I was watching some of your interviews and whatnot on YouTube, and there was one from uh, recent on a program called Social Yet Distance with uh, Jack Farrell and Fran Locke, and in there they talk about uh, how prolific you are. So I wondered if there's a secret to that, what kind of daily work habits you have. You could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, sure, unlike, unlike a lot of people, and I've talked to Jack about this, Jack and I are old friends. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sort of like, you know, I get inspired like anyone, but um, this is actually how I, I make my living and how I've made a living for a long time. Um, so you sort of have to run it like a business, almost like a nine to five in certain ways. Um, and the way that I maintain like that sort of prolific work ethic is to like, I, I write a lot of books that are like uh, themed pieces because they'll come a lot faster than individual like one off poems, although I still do my share of those too. And you've been involved in publishing since uh, about 15 years old, I think, I believe I remember you uh, saying yeah. that in that program. Yeah, since, uh, so how did that get started? Uh, yeah, since, since 92, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, well, it, it, my work is much different now, but Gregory Corso was a family friend um, and he sort of got me, uh, got me in through the door of all this my poetry back then was pretty terrible mm. probably like a lot of ours is at yeah, start somewhere right <laughs> yeah yeah and so like i just published really bad I, you know i wrote really bad poems i published really bad poems for a long time and then when i hit about 19 maybe 20 something sort of clicked and the the pieces while well, nobody's perfect they but they did get they got better so mm -hmm. oh excellent did you see a progress as you you know as you continue to, to work you know like you know was it a matter of you know there was no sudden like shift into better poetry it was a, a timely you know over a period of time yeah it's just investing a certain amount of time in anything and reading as much mm -hmm. as you can i always say that if you are not reading you have no business writing i, I fact, agree i don't Absolutely. even i don't even know why anyone would want to write if they're not reading anything but uh, you know my work tends to go through shifts every like four or five years now like major shifts but in the beginning getting better was just a matter of uh, just persistence that's all time can you maybe describe some of those shifts maybe you give us an idea of what you mean by that like uh, yeah I, I can um you know I think you know when you're a kid it's just uh you know I I told I think I told Jack the first poem I ever wrote was for a girl which I think you know a lot of 15 year old guys it's probably they might have a similar answer mm -hmm. um but in terms of like major shifts like when I hit my like mid twenties, I was writing like what I would refer to as like pop culture abstractions, mm -hmm. like uh, 
non sequiturs related to like American pop culture. Um, and I did that for a long time. And then a friend of mine said that he liked what I did, but he didn't come away from it knowing any more about me as a person. Um, mm -hmm. Other than my like, other than my personal taste in like literature and music and everything like that. So it really, that really changed so much for me. And I started to really write about my step, about myself, about things that were painful, about things that maybe other people wouldn't be willing to put down on paper. Um, and I did that for a long while. And then it kind of, then I started writing about friends and people I had met. Um, before the pandemic, I was giving 100 readings a year. So mm -hmm. I had met a lot of people. So I wrote, so it, it, the work started to veer towards more like um, almost being a portrait painter. Hmm. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm still doing a little bit of that. I'm kind of coming to the end of that. And I'm looking forward to like whatever the next phase is for me. And I don't know quite what that is. And you do a lot of themed writing. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the recent stuff you've done with uh, the with theme? Sure. Um, I recently put out a book called The Prettiest Girl at the Dance, which uh, came out on Blue Horse Press out of California. Um, mm -hmm. And I've done, this is my second book with them, but that book, um, it started because I wrote a poem called The Prettiest Girl in Moscow, Kansas, which is a town in the middle of nowhere. And it was about a girl that I saw that was working at a store. And the name of the store was The Store. That's how boring the town was. <laughs> um, and so I, I wanted to write about her. And then my best friend, Victor Clevenger, liked that piece so much that he was like, oh, you, you've been so many places. You should write um, a series of those poems. So I, I wrote a series of um, the prettiest girl in a particular town, a particular country. Um, and before mm -hmm. I knew it, I had about 60 of those. Um, they're still sort of coming out of me a little bit. I, I hope to have like, uh, I hope to have about a hundred of them when I'm done. Um, and af after that happens, I really want to try to move on and make some sort of major shift in another direction, but I don't, I really don't know what that, that is, but uh, it's exciting. So each of those, each of those poems is sort of like, it's really about a, a real person that you imagine a history to, or is it a, you know, um, somebody uh, just an imaginary figure of some sort? Uh, no, none of them are imaginary figures. Uh, some of them are people I've met for like two or three minutes. And I mm -hmm. might I might imagine a history of that person or with that person. Some of them are people that I know very well, um, but none of them are completely imaginary. I have to at least had some sort of interaction. Um, and oh, okay. I'm okay. So getting to know people, it's, it seems like it's like a interpersonal experience. Uh, it it is. I mean, I've been to uh, I've been to forty nine states and a few different countries, so it was not hard to draw from those uh, from that geography to write the poems. Well, do you have any any exciting travel stories that you'd like to share? That like on the road, you know, maybe some people you hung out with or anything really fun that people might be interested in. Oh yeah, I've I mean I've hung out with my share of uh pretty pretty fascinating people. Um the other day, no, it was last week, a friend of mine and I drove to Lexington, Kentucky just to get fried chicken. Mm. Uh, which, which is about seven hours from my house. And uh we just were telling someone else about some stories that we had gone through. Um, you know, we they're, that are just like a pure hijinks. Some of it doesn't seem like it could be real, but they are things that have happened. But we were telling a younger poet about a trip we took to Chicago where um, the car we were in exploded um, mm -hmm. basically when we were like on a median, right on like a median strip in the middle of the freeway. Um, and uh, we couldn't get a tow truck to come pick us up. And we, we waited for hours and hours. Um, we, we also told him about like, uh, we were going through Texas and we actually drove into like the eye of a tornado. Mm. It, because it was, 
it was a certain time of night where it was also incredibly sunny and we could not see in front of our faces. And we, the only things we could see is that there were cars parked on every, everywhere. And we wondered why they had stopped, but um, you know, we were like, well, we'll just keep going. So we actually went, go, went through the eye of this tornado. And then hmm. we, uh, we stopped at a gas station, like after about 30 miles that had nearly been wiped out. But I have hmm. all kinds of stories like that. I, I was in a car in San Jose that uh, jackknifed on the freeway in the middle of a dust storm. Um, mm. and all of this, all of this relates to like going to poetry readings, all of like a lot of stories. You should probably write some memoirs at some point, travel, travel memoirs. Um, so who are, who are some of the people you've, uh, you've met over the years? I mean, I'm sure you've met quite a few interesting people. Uh, maybe give us a sample of some of the most interesting figures uh, that you've run across. Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just think just thinking about who I met. I, you know, I've been I was hauled up in a bar where we couldn't go outside one time where I sat uh, drinking like bottles of water with Henry Rollins, who truly is as straight edge as he projects himself to be. <laughs> like, um, I just hmm. any yeah, like any any number of people I've read with uh, I've read with people I don't really deserve like deserve to have read with so hmm. so many um i uh, i traveled for a long time with s.a griffin who was the co-editor of the outlaw bible of american poetry mm -hmm. who's one of my best friends we used to um i used to do road we used to do big tours together for a long time probably from 2005 through like 2012 but we got together again recently right before the pandemic hit and we did a big show out in la um you know, it's uh, yeah, that's that's hard. It's it's so hard. I I've to by think. any chance did you know Scott Wanberg? I did. Scott Wanberg was one of my best friends. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. He friended me on Facebook some time ago when a long long time ago, and I didn't know he passed away until like you know several years. I think it was he was on my Facebook, and I was like, wow, yeah. yeah. This yeah, this August is actually the tenth anniversary of Scott's death. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Scott was a dear, dear friend of mine. He and S.A. and I did a book together called Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel. Mm -hmm. um, and we did. And then after he passed, S.A. and I got together again and we took some, some of Scott's unpublished material. and We did another three way book uh, called Harvey Corman, Harvey Corman, Harvey Corman. Um, and there are still some unpublished material scots um, that we're talking about doing a third book, maybe maybe next year. Wow, that's exciting, man! It's, we're doing a legacy project ourselves with my press and people I know for somebody who passed away with on our end. So it's a really uh, tough experience, and it's it's you know keeps the memory alive. Uh, I commend you for it. Um, would you like to share a, a work or two? Uh, actually, I know what I'm going to do. I was going to share one of my poems, but I'll share one of Scott's. I'm going to grab one. Okay. Why is um, working towards getting the book? I want us to understand that poetry is one of the most powerful ways of conveying your message beyond even the environment you find yourself. If you want to heal yourself through poetry, you get yourself properly healed. Some people became poor because of their experience in life or their society. All right, I think he's back. Over to you, Darcy. I'll go for it. It's a tear piece of yours, or Scott's actually, in yeah, this, this case. Is, um, this is actually a little book um, that my friend Victor and I, we put out about 10 books a year and they're all made by hand. Um, and we did a little book of Scott's, some of his unpublished poems uh, last year. And this is one of those. This is uh, called Death Has a Toothache, or sorry, mm. Death Has a Headache. Last night, death came over to the party. It drank some single malt scotch and lied about its upbringing. Death has a way of getting all the young photogenic people interested in every word it says. 
Maybe it's the cultured accent it uses. Maybe it's the way it stands. Death got a headache through Death got a headache though and asked our host for aspirin. Unfortunately, there was none. Death instead drank three cups of black coffee. That will erase my headache, it said. Someone put some good dance music on. Death asked a 15-year-old to dance with it. The 15-year-old smiled and allowed death to lead. Kiss me, death smiled. Could this be love? Perhaps fear. Someone turned out the lights. Death glowed. The 15-year-old sang. Mm. Very emotive oh, reading. This made me remember Beautiful. the poem of uh, John Donne, Dead Be Not Proud. Remember that poem? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. So what inspired you to write the poem? Oh, that, that was a poem by Scott Wanberg, as I was telling Dustin, and uh, Scott passed away 10 okay, years Scott, ago. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So where can we find some of your work? Uh, I mean, uh, obviously you would sell by hand, but is there any other venues, bookstores that regularly, you know, keep your work on the shelves? Um, yeah, I can. Um, well, Amazon always has it. Um, and then Barnes and Noble has some of it. Um, and as far as independents go, it can be, a lot of my work can be found at a store called Bell Book and Candle, which is in Bell, Missouri. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't have to go there. You give them, give them a call. They have a lot of stuff. Um, Caliban Bookshop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, has a lot of my stuff on display. Um, uh, the book collector in Sacramento used to have a lot of it. I don't know now. Um, but yeah, a lot of sporadic, like independent bookstores. Um, Prospero's Books in Kansas City um, okay. probably probably has about half of my catalog. Hmm. Um, and then in terms of like archival purposes beyond bookstores themselves, um, my work is archived with Yale, UCLA and the Smithsonian. Okay. That's interesting. How did that, how did that come about? Um, I done a lot of work over the years with uh, Bill Roberts, who used to, or who runs Bottle of Smoke Press in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and Yale bought his entire archive, including everything he published by me. Um, and so he has a deal with them now that every new thing I do, um, that gets bought as well. And that gets added to the Yale archive. Um, S.A. Griffin donated his entire archive to UCLA. Um, and so I just, whenever I want more of my material in the UCLA archive, I just send it to him uh, and he forwards it to them. Um, and in terms of the Smithsonian, I'm a member of a group in Los Angeles called the Temple of Man. Um, and the Smithsonian bought the entire Temple of Man archive. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm in there that way. But, um, the Temple of Man is a group of poets and artists and actors and all sorts of interesting people that has been around since 1960. And I've, I've been a member probably for 13 or 14 years. So you used to be what would we call a starving artist at, you know, early in your life. Do you have any advice out there for, for that type the starving artist, how to get off their, on their feet? Um, you know, I think, yeah, I literally, literally, literally was a starving artist. There were points where I wasn't eating for three or four days at a time. And one of the things that saved me was that a lot of my friends were musicians and not poets. And so like in between sets, when my friends would play at bars, when they were breaking down equipment, uh, they'd let me come up and read two or three poems. And then that led to me selling a fair amount of books. And so I would go around doing that probably like every night of the month, um, just with a tote bag and make my rent that way. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's sort of what I would recommend. You kind of, you know, once the pandemic's over, you could do something like that. Um, you kind of have to be relentless. And I was, and you can, you can grind it out and you can do it, but you're going to have to do it every day. <laughs> right. Consistency is the, the key to 
to uh, success, I guess, is, is the last words we have here. We have about three minutes. So if you want to plug any any new projects or, you know, anything you're working on, how to get in contact with you, anything of that nature, um, then go right ahead and, you know, get plenty of time to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say um, the thing that I'm always doing, my friend Victor Kleberger and I, our press, Riverdog, we publish generally about 10 books a year in one magazine issue. And people can subscribe to that for like $20 and they get everything for the entire year. And so one of the things that I'm doing right now is a little book on our press uh, with my friend from Britain, Bobby Parker. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And beyond that, um, OAC Books, which is based in, in Missouri and Kansas, just released this book, which is called Which Way to the River, which is on Amazon. Um, and it contains 500 pages of my work collected between 2016 and 2020. Um, and this, this is the Prettiest Girl at the Dance um, book. Mm -hmm. And that's on Amazon too. And really, that, those are the things I'm, I'm really pushing right now. Other than that, I'm just trying to read so I can write more. I imagine the quarantine has affected that. And, you know, you probably not able to do as much public reading, but more private reading, you know, in the home. So that's probably, is there anything specific you're, you're digging your teeth into right now? Um, I'm going back. I've been going back and reading um, the collected poems of Frank Stanford. Um, okay. And also I've been, I always go back and read uh, both uh, Richard Hugo and Everett Maddox. And mm -hmm. Everett Maddox is the one who's really, really unknown. He was uh, one of the finest poets to ever come out of New Orleans. Um, and if people want to message me on Facebook, I will tell you all about him. I've probably helped sell more copies of his book than anyone else I know. Uh, but he died at <laughs> 44, so he needs someone out there pushing. Excellent. In 30 seconds, so, what message do you have for the generalities of creative writers across the globe? Um, yeah, I would say no one is going to come to you. Like, it's kind of what I was saying to Dustin. Like, read, read everything you can and push whatever way you can. Um, I, I meet a lot of particularly younger writers that think the world is going to come to them, but you have to, like, push at it, like, 30 days out of the month. <laughs> And uh, that's that's my advice, because um, the world is going to tell you you can't do it, um, but but if you really want to, you you can do it. So, it's excellent advice. The world Fulfill really the dream. wants. We say you can't do it, but if you really want to, you definitely can do it. That is the message of our guest today. We sincerely appreciate your time, Darcy John. Uh, we hope that uh, if we call you next time, you will respond to our call as people would want to learn from you again and again. Thank you so much for your time. Dear viewers, this is going to be where we're going to put a cut in of the program for today. Meet us tomorrow, where we'll meet another writers from another part of the world. This time around, we're not going to the state. We're going to Denmark. Who is this person? Wait until we meet there. Thank you so much. Bye, John. See you. Thanks again. You. Peace yeah. out. All right, see you guys.